Coming up next on The Jeff Crilly Show, you'll meet a breast cancer survivor who believes that her journey is meant to be shared. That's next. Many are predicting that the worst is yet to come, which is unfortunate, said one person here. Until now, they've enjoyed the reputation of being the nation's icebox. Watched a burglar in his home this morning by webcam. As a journalist of over 25 years, stories are what make my world turn. Reporting live from the Dallas Newsroom tonight, Jeff Crilly, Fox 4 News. But in 2008, I took the jump from my familiar life and started a PR firm from my home. We're talking about anyone with a camcorder like the one I'm using becomes a television network. We started slowly growing the company and we now have over a hundred clients and we've branched into the world of live digital broadcasting. I now own eight different TV studios and have a huge team. And the stories that I now get to share are sometimes the most important of my life. Life has a funny way of coming around full circle. This is the Jeff Crilly Show. Well, obviously, it takes a lot of courage to survive breast cancer, and it takes another level of courage to share your journey with others. To talk about that, Dr. Robin, Robin Hall, she's an entrepreneur, author, and speaker. Thanks for coming into the Thank studio you. this morning. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, this is such an honor, and um, I, I know it's not easy to share your story. It's painful. But uh, first of all, tell us why you're sharing it. Well, I'm sharing it because I think other women will benefit from my story. You know, it all started um, in 2021. One morning I got out of the shower and I noticed that my right breast was a little bit larger than my left. And that's not supposed to happen. Now, a lot of women are asymmetrical. And if that's always been the case, it's okay. But this was new. And, I was, and so then I examined myself and I felt a mass. And I couldn't believe it because seven months before that, I had just had a mammogram and an ultrasound and both of them were normal. So here we are seven months later, I'm seeing a change. So I went and had another mammogram done and it was normal, but the ultrasound showed a mass. And even though the radiologist thought that it didn't look worrisome, because of that interval of seven months being different, she thought that I should have a biopsy. So I did have a biopsy and it was a very fast growing cancer. So I was very happy that I found it when I did. In fact, it was a lot larger than it looked on ultrasound because I have very dense breast tissue. And women that have very dense breast tissue, it's hard to interpret mammography on them because a mammogram if you have dense breast tissue, it'll show up as white. Well, a tumor will show up as white also. So you can't see that contrast, and that's what was happening with me. But the ultrasound showed it, and when they actually took it out, it was over four centimeters, which is very big. It looked like it was a little over one centimeter on the ultrasound. But a double mastectomy was recommended. I had that done and had reconstruction eight weeks later. And fortunately, by the grace of God, it was not in my lymph nodes. And so I didn't have to have any chemotherapy. But I do have to take medication for the next seven years. And so the reason I want to share that story is because a lot of women are told they have a normal mammogram. But if they have dense breast tissue, they really should ask to have additional imaging done. And a lot of times that's not just an automatic. There's different laws in different states about that. Um, and you want to have the radiologist actually categorize how dense your breast tissue is. Mine was a category C, which is very dense. And so over the years, we've been watching me with ultrasounds and MRIs, but a lot of women don't get that because it's not just an automatic thing that the doctors are ordering. And you're, you're brave enough to put it all in a book which you're writing. It will be, we released this fall, is that right? Yes, it'll be released this fall. We're going to put the cover up on the screen. I love the name, uh, The Other Side of Illness, Unexpected Blessings. And in the book, you also talk about your husband. Yes, the book is a compilation of stories, true stories, of people that have had all different types of health adversities. It's not just cancer. And remarkable things that came from that journey that would not have happened had they not gone through it. And so a few years ago, you know, I started my practice, the second practice in midlife, and that was a concierge practice. 
And during that time, a lot of stressful things happened. We had the recession. My mother died. My husband's parents and his brother died. Then my husband was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And then uh, shortly thereafter, now I'm diagnosed. And so life throws you curveballs that you can't expect. And that's what's happened with people in these stories that I've written about, not just us, but things, just unbelievable things. People have epiphanies. They may start a foundation. They may have reconnected with somebody they were estranged from. So the whole purpose of the book is to bring inspiration to people not only the person that may be going through some health adversity, but also their caregiver, because it's a very lonely and isolating situation. And all of those hours I was sitting there with my husband while he got chemotherapy, I would have loved to have had a book to just pick up, read a story here and there that just lifted my spirits and said, okay, there's gonna be something good on the other side of this. T tell me this, Dr. Hall, as a physician, you have had to break bad news to people countless times. Yes. Did, did it, it didn't make it any easier for you when it was happening to you. No, it, it wasn't. You know, anytime you hear that C word, it doesn't matter whether you're a doctor or, an, or not. The first thing you think of is, I'm going to die. That's just the first thing. In my case, it's interesting. I didn't think that. What I thought is, and, and maybe it's just my training and having gone through what I did with my husband, it was more like, oh my gosh, what's the next step? What do we need to do next? What's this gonna mean for my practice? How am I gonna continue seeing patients? What's it gonna mean to my family? So those were my thoughts rather than I'm going to die. But I think it's because I've had over 30 years of experience in working with patients and then my husband. So when it came to me, I was in that problem solving mode, like what are we gonna do next? Wow. And uh, you've gotten the attention of the Today Show, uh, Today Show Digital. We're going to put this on the screen because mm -hmm. I was, as I was doing homework, I was really <laughs> impressed. Uh, what was that like when you got the call from the Today Show that they were going to feature you on their, their online Well, platform? I was quite surprised. They had seen me on a television show out of Indiana when I was telling my story. And so they felt like it was very important that that story be told because so many women do have dense breast tissue and they get a false sense of security when they're told that their mammogram is normal. And so what we were trying to let women know is it doesn't matter if you had a normal mammogram three months ago, if you see some change in your breast that wasn't there before, and that can be one breast getting larger than the other or seeing the nipple retracted like it's pulling in or skin dimpling, anything like that that's different don't just assume everything is fine because you had that normal mammogram. It still needs to be looked into. And so what was interesting is right after they did that story on me, they talked to Katie Curry and her, um, Katie Curry, her, she had the same situation. She had dense breast tissue. And I don't know when her previous mammogram had been, but it was interesting that all of that kind of happened at the same time. So they have her story on there as well. Wow. Well, we mentioned that you started a concierge physician business, and I want, yes. I want to uh, put a spotlight on that because these days it seems like there's a concierge physician on every street corner, but when you started your practice, there wasn't really anything like this. That's right. You know, I had been in a managed care situation for over 15 years, and if you went into my office, there were piles of charts everywhere. I spent so much time on paperwork only to have the next day another round of paperwork. Now this was before we had electronic medical records. And I was getting very dissatisfied because I had less and less time to see patients and it seemed like everything was about paperwork. I was trained to put my stethoscope on the person's chest, not on the paperwork. And so what's interesting about that, well, one thing, the straw that broke the camel's back was one day a young woman, made an appointment to, for a sore throat. But in actuality, when I walked into the office, she didn't have a sore throat, she was in tears, and she confided in me that she'd been date raped. Mm. And you know, that's not something that you can just pat someone on the hand and say, I'm really sorry that happened to you, but my time's up. Because for an acute care visit, you have less than 15 minutes. 
So she needed my time and attention. And I said, something's got to give. This is not what I was trained to do. I was trained to spend more time with people to really get to know them, develop that relationship, teach them how to be healthier, not that sick care model. So interestingly enough, a few weeks later, I got a call from a gentleman in the community and he knew about me. He invited me to lunch, nice Italian restaurant, and wanted to talk to me about an opportunity for a concierge franchise. They were interested in hiring me or at least talking to me about it. And as I was listening to him about the whole concept, they brought the bread out. While I was buttering my bread, the light bulb went on and I said, this is my answer, but I don't want to go to work for a franchise. I want to do my own model. So I go home, tell my husband, guess what? I want to quit my job, start over again in midlife. I was 48 at the time and start this unique model of healthcare because I felt like people deserve more time and attention and there's so much that we can do on a preventive side that I'm not able to do in the managed care world. And so, uh, believe me, people thought I was absolutely nuts because why are you leaving a successful practice to go down to one income to start an unheard of model and who do you think is gonna pay for that over and above their insurance? And so I had a lot of naysayers, but I really felt convicted that this is what I was supposed to do. The bankers were a hard sell also. They thought it was a high risk proposition, but as I was able to get the funding and I started Destination Health at the end of 2005 and started seeing patients at the first of 2006. And it was one of the best decisions that I ever made. And it's been wildly successful. We found a great yes. video. Let's go ahead and roll that. I'm proud that Destination Health is the legacy concierge practice in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that other practices try to emulate. Back in 2006, when I started concierge medicine, nobody even knew what that was. And now others have tried to follow the state-of-the-art model. I love working here. Um, I always tell all the team members, as long as you're wanting to put the key in the door, and step over the red carpet and work with Destination Health each and every day, it's the best place to be. I started with Dr. Hall back in May of 2010. So we've seen a lot of growth and changes. Dr. Hall started Destination Health in 2006. She had left a family practice managed care office because she wanted to be able to devote time to her patients. Instead of them being a number, she wanted to have that time with each person to develop a relationship, a physician, patient, and also to help patients, you know, health become better. Dr. Hall's the best. I mean, I've uh, uh, not had a relationship like that with a physician before. I have family members that are physicians and uh, I understand how their practice works and, and uh, because they're the traditional system and the compensation basically it works. They spend one or two minutes with you. They can't afford to spend any more time with the patient. That's all there is to it. Uh, Dr. Hall spent all the time you need there. She knows you extremely well. We have patients that have been here for years. They come here and they don't leave. And that says a lot right there for a patient to come and um, be here for many years. I've had several patients that I've been taking care of for six plus years. Dr. Hall, I know she has been taking care of them for you know over 10 years. One of the things that's different about our office at Destination Health is that when you come in, it's warm and welcoming and not sterile and impersonal. All of the staff knows each patient by name and our providers know our patient's medical history and all the little idiosyncrasies about them that they want to share with us. Get to know each other on you know, fairly personal basis, which for me is very important because I'm a very social, kind of creature, so it, I feel a trust and a level of trust with her that I'm, I'm not at with the other physician. I love the work family atmosphere that we have. I love that at lunchtime, Dr. Hall and Dr. Ducharme, you know, they'll sit back there at lunch and we all chat, you know, and it's awesome. We're, we work as a team here, so if we have a patient's labs, 
we're not going to have just Dr. Hall look at it. We'll all brainstorm and look at what the best option would be because we each bring something different to the table with our expertise. I practice what I prescribe. I, I may tell you, you need to eat healthier, you need to exercise, you need to sleep better, you need to de-stress in your life. I do those four things every single day. I am in the trenches with you. Not a lot of people can say they have three providers looking over their health. We have Dr. Ducharme, Dr. Hall and I are all looking at their labs. We're all collaborating together to figure out the best treatment option and plan for that patient. Whether it's Dr. Hall or Rachel or Julie or Leslie, we all practice what we preach. I love working here because of with Dr. Hall and the amazing providers, the amazing team we have here, the camaraderie we have, the, the care and the compassion for our patients and wanting to help others to improve their health. Our patients are our top priority. Wow, you have to be so proud. Thank you. <laughs> now, I understand you recently sold, but it's in good hands. Yes, I sold the practice in April after I was diagnosed with breast cancer to Dr. Ducharme. He is the physician you saw on the video, and he's worked for me for a couple of years, and he's carrying on the legacy. He's wonderful. Patients love him, and Rachel, the nurse practitioner, is there, and we have another nurse practitioner there as well, and I'm working just a few days a month to help them out. Well, I love the model because often if a patient feels rushed, they're not going to admit something to you that, exactly. uh, but you, a longer visit might reveal something that they w weren't going to tell you. Exactly. I know that I made diagnoses in this practice that I probably would not have in my old practice. And, you know, unfortunately, not everybody can be served in this type of model, but it's very rewarding for the patient and for the doctor to be able to dig deeper and, and help those people out. Wow, well, we're almost out of time, so I wanna uh, circle back to your breast cancer journey. Uh, tell the audience what you need them to do in terms of like how often should they get a, a checkup? Well, women should check their breast once a month. And a lot of people tell me, well, I don't know what I'm feeling or I forget. So I tell postmenopausal women to just check themselves on the first day of the month. Maybe you sit down and pay bills on that day or whatever, just take the first day of the month. And um, for women that are still menstruating, we recommend they check themselves about five to seven days after they've started their cycle because their breasts are less lumpy bumpy at that time and they need to look at themselves in the mirror. A lot of women don't ever look at themselves in the mirror, so they wanna see, like I mentioned before, about symmetry, that kind of thing, and then get their regular mammograms once a year after they're 40, but if they see a change in between those mammograms, they still need to let the doctor know. Yeah, and I know during the pandemic, a lot of people kind of put off their appointments, so it's yes, so Yes, unfortunately, critical. they did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Dr. Hall, you certainly inspire me. We're going to have to have right. you come back when the book is out. We're going to right. end you. with her website, which is drrobinhall.com. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. That's it for now. We'll see you next time.